It's funny how many women, in fact all women, all women at all levels, have the imposter syndrome. And uh, what we all feel like we're not quite sure what we're doing, but we do it anyway. Welcome to the Convene podcast. My name is Magdalena Danasova, Convene's digital media editor and your host throughout this first season of the Convene podcast series, where we brought together the perspectives of different generations on hot industry topics. In this episode, we discuss the future of work together with Laura Caprioli and Dr. Zina Burgess. Enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Convene podcast. It's a pleasure having you both here today discussing future of work, a very exciting topic. And let's start directly with some introductions. Laura, maybe if we can start with you, if you can briefly introduce yourself and share a bit about your background and how many years you've been in the industry. Yes, absolutely. I'm Laura Caprioli. I'm the Growth Program and Stakeholder Manager at Visit Britain, Visit England. I've been working in the company and in the business events industry for four years now. And before them, I was studying and working in leisure tourism. And my role at the moment as Visit Britain is working with many stakeholders, mainly our UK city convention bureaus and destination management organizations, trying to improve their capability and supporting their proposition in attracting key international business events in Britain. Wonderful. And we should say you're 20 in their 20s, the class of 2023. I am, yes. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much. And Zina? I'm Zena Burgess. I'm the CEO of the Australian Psychological Society. I think I've been working as a CEO now for about 25 years, maybe even longer. I've worked as the CEO of associations, marketing companies, HR companies, so a broad range of things as well as being a consultant for a number of years. I'm an organisational psychologist by training and I've worked with the events management industry throughout my whole career. Wonderful. Thank you both again for being here. In the modern landscape, uh, finding meaning in one's work has become increasingly important. How do each of you approach this quest for meaning in your current roles? Uh, Zina, let's start with you. I think it's become much more obvious to people that that's what everyone wants, but I think it's always been there. As a CEO, my job is to help all of the staff, including myself and the board, understand the story of the organisation. It's come from one place, we're going to a new place and it's going to be an exciting and positive journey. But it's about changing expectations and the expectations are very much about growth, development, community relevance and being there for a higher purpose. And it doesn't matter what your industry is, they're common themes. Yeah, I I do totally agree with that. Everything I do in, in my work and my life in general, I do look if there is a purpose, if there is a mission or something to reach out to. Most of the time with jobs, we really talk about, I don't know, the money and the whole benefits. And, you know, these are things that are okay, important to consider, but they are not really enough anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's that purpose-driven culture that you have in an organisation that is what people really value a lot. And very interesting is also um, a couple of weeks ago, I think, PCMA Convent published uh, some answer from what well, myself and some of my fellow classmates in 20 in their 20s said about what they like mm. in their jobs. And to me, it was very interesting to see what they wrote and what they said, because we all come from different backgrounds. We work for different organisations. You know, I work for a destination, someone represents a venue, or they come from an association background or event agencies. So we all like different things and aspects of our jobs, but there was this common thing that what we all really liked is to have this sense of, you know, this purpose, this giving a sense and a meaning on what you do. You know, it's when you arrive really at the end of the day or, you know, you've, you've been the entire day at the office or on an event site and you're so stressed and tired, but at the same time you have that really good feeling that what you have achieved on that day, you know, and it's great. Really. You're 100% right. The whole idea of what you get paid, that's a hygiene factor, you know, where's the office, do you get paid? It's more about what are we going to achieve together? You know, how can you grow as a person? Um, What can you learn? What can you learn that will help the company develop? It's very much about your personal journey and the organisation's journey being aligned. And that's why people change jobs. After a period of time, you learn what you can learn. You either move into another job or you move into another organisation and what I always, I'm very excited for people that do that because they're often ambassadors for the, for my organisation 
and they speak really highly of it. So it brings more wonderful people in as well. Yes. Having people that are really enthusiastic about Absolutely. what they do about the organisation, yep. really great ambassador for, for the work, for yep. the industry, yep. etc. And I like how you said it's a hygiene factor where in the offices and of course the money are important. We, we need money to live, right? But especially touching on this topic about office work post-pandemic has become a whole yes. new set of conversation now. Yes, so what are your policies now post-pandemic? <laughs> well, I'll go back a little further. Even pre-pandemic, my view is that people could work from home if they wanted to. And then the pandemic came and I was actually appointed to my job during the pandemic. So I didn't meet anybody in real life for quite some time, particularly in Australia, where in my city we had the longest lockdown in the world. So everyone was working at home and I, I looked at the profile of the staff and I asked them and they all said they liked working at home but wanted to come in from time to time. So I've shaped the policy around that, that they can come in whenever they want to, but if they want to work from home, they can. But a couple of times a year, I'll ask everyone from all over the country to come into the office and we have a festival day. And at the festival day, we do briefings, but we have lunch together, we have a speed dating section where everybody meets people they haven't met before and talks to them. We have an ask, ask the CEO any question about anything session, which people love. And it's a real celebration of, of connectedness. And then people go off and work in their teams again. Generally, what I, I would say and what I coach organisations in is when you're onboarding staff, they're new to the organisation, it's really important to have them come in, meet their team, meet all the key people they're going to work with so they feel really connected with their group. When you're kicking off a new project, get people together to do a bit of a brainstorm about this is our vision, this is where we're going, this is what it'll be. And when you're finishing a project or hitting a big milestone, it's good to celebrate success. It's very easy to keep working, working, working. And you talked about having a sense of personal achievement. I think that's really important. And I think it's equally important to share that with your colleagues. So you all celebrate, hey, we made it, we got there. I think there are really three key times to get together. I love the fact that you called it a festival. Yes. Because it's usually on all hands. No, or... it's meant to be a, a joyous thing to come together exactly. with your colleagues. If you're going to have a hard meeting, you can do that on Zoom. <laughs> well said. Yeah. Right. And it's very similar um, at VC Britain as well. So they never really had any problems before if we wanted to work from home, like before the pandemic. But then just after when everybody was like, should I go back to office? What can I do? The office has always been available for the people that wanted to come in and everyone is very flexible to in whenever they want. Some people like to get there more, some people less. But because we're quite a big organization, what they decided to do is let's do some research. And they, they conducted a survey just to feel like how everyone was feeling, what they actually would have liked to do, not like to do. So we have a bit of a hybrid approach at the moment. You know that the office is there, it's always open. I tend to go in the office like two, three days a week. Mm -hmm. I like seeing people face to face, especially my team. And you know, this is a busy period working on mm. many projects, so it, it helps. But then there are other weeks where I'm like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't really need it. I feel like I can do that work from home. And I know that I have that flexibility, but I'm able to do it. And then yes, there are some days where as well, we like meet all together. Not really the whole company because we have many offices across the world. So flying everyone into London <laughs> is, is not that easy and not very sustainable at the same time. But in each area and in each division that we have, we tend to bring all the people in to meet, you know, have, have long meeting, maybe like discuss important things. And then we also have the relaxing and fun part afterwards, going out for drinks yeah. or like celebrating, you know, personal achievements, things like that, which is, I think it's very important. And me, when I go into the office, I don't get any of my work done. But by the time I go around and talk to everybody who's there, catch up with them on what they're working on and what they'd like to tell the CEO about, that's my day gone. But it's valuable because that's about connectedness and it's about showing that you are visible and showing that you care about people. So it's, it's time well spent, but it's not time I can spend writing or thinking. It's just supporting people time. Yeah. But do you feel also, probably that's, again, heightened because of now the world post-pandemic, but when we go to an office space, it makes more sense to really connect to people and not to be stressed out about calls or doing your day-to-day -day that you do at home, but rather really having this 
yeah. bond or working on projects together, mm. but having this meaningful connection while we are together. In Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it's a different way of using an office space. If you're going to sit on a computer, you do that at home. It's about the face-to-face -face component, the connection component, the creativity component. They're the reasons you want to be with another human, I think. I totally agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> and it, in this world, now that we're so influenced by AI and all the technological mm -hmm. developments, mm -hmm. do you feel that in the industry or in your respective organizations, soft skills now are much more important in people? The research has shown that for the last 15 years, it's been the soft skills that's led people to getting promotion, not the technical skills. I think it's an awful term, soft skills, because it makes it sound like it's not kind of that important and yet it's critically important and when you look at senior management recruitment it's usually those skills and the political nous and the strategic thinking that lead to people being appointed and in fact I appoint people based on their interpersonal skills and openness to learning not their industry background. Yeah, absolutely. I recently started recruiting for new people in our team and what I really look at most of the time it's really soft skills as mm. willingness to learn, their flexibility, if they are curious, really interested, and all I don't know, empathy, emotional intelligence mm. in general, that, that's also something I really looked at. Of course, you know, there are those technical hard mm. skills which are important, especially for some type of roles. Mm. Um, how do you but, evaluate soft skills? Because I, I believe that's why right, they were called soft skills, even though they sound mm. squishy, they're so important, but they're so hard to measure. How do you measure willingness? Um, we, we do a lot of behavioural interviewing. I do testing around emotional intelligence and business acumen. We do case examples. If you interview people's uh, referees well, you can find out a lot about what they don't say as much <laughs> as what they do say. I talk to people about their profile, their assessed profile and do behavioural interviewing. But then, I mean, I'm psych trained, so that helps yes. a bit too. I also don't run interviews in a formal way. They're conversations usually with a range of different people because I think it's really important to meet the people you might be working with as well as meet the people you'll be reporting to because both people are buying. Yes. It's not, I'm the employer, so I'm buying labour. You're making a marriage. You want yeah. it to work. Yes. What we are doing also as putting it a sort of recruiting panel or interview panel, mm. people coming from different generations of different backgrounds, mm. because that also helps providing different perspectives on the candidates. You know, I might have an opinion and then, you know, I have a male boss who's 20 years older than me and he might think something totally different and that helps having different mm. perspectives mm. and, you know, saying what one thing or what another thing. And this generation gap is very interesting to me. I know that we mentioned, and it's a big discussion now, that we have five generations mm. in the workplace. And to me, I, I love it. I just love it. <laughs> because I think there is so much to learn mm. from each generation. I mean, so many good things and opportunities or things that I just grasped. And I know that I fall into one of the younger generation and there is lots of stereotypes around, you know, there are some people that said, oh, you know, younger generation are lazy and entitled. And when there are young generation that thinks of the older ones as outdated, you know, but apart from these stereotypes, it's just, you know, different ways of approaching things, maybe different perspective, maybe like different values. But mm -hmm. there is something really good in each generation. There can be challenges of these people working together sometimes. It's not easy probably to handle and managing an organization with so many different people, but at the same time, they can also really complement each other. You can really learn a lot from, from each other. Mm. So yeah, having this different generation, different people in an interview panel really, really helps as well. And then having someone, I recently found out in the interview panel who is more or less your age, mm. or about someone you identify with, it also helps and relaxes you in the mm. interview. I never really want to do something like very, formal, structured discussion. I like a bit more informal, like interviews, more of a relaxed conversation, mm. putting a person really comfortable because once you're comfortable, that's when mm. you can start open up and really say what we want to hear from uh, the employer perspective. Mm. Well, if you have lots of standard fixed questions, very formal, you know, maybe you have that sort of prepared answer in your mind and doesn't necessarily reflect the person you are. 
mm. uh, I believe. I think what you said about the mixed panel is really important because the research shows that you're much more likely to appoint someone who's similar to yourself. So if yeah. you've got a panel that's all the same, you're likely to appoint another candidate who's just the same again. And when you've got all people that are the same, you all tend to see the world through the same window. And so what's new in that? It's boring. So the mixed panel is really good. I don't know about the generational thing in the workplace because my workplace is so mixed anyway, but it's about how people are treated. It's not about the age they are or their culture. Either. It's really about how respect is shown and how welcoming you are to people's different ideas. And I find the more different ideas, the more fascinating. So I'm forever asking, tell me, what do you see? What do you think? Does that work? I don't know anything about it. I mean, social media, for example. I mean, I came from an era where there was no social media, there were no computers. People used to take shorthand, I don't know how, but anyway, and write letters backwards and forwards on paper. Libraries had cards and you didn't even go and get the books yourself. So I've seen lots of different changes. It's all fascinating because I can ask one of my staff and, like, if you, what do you think, Laura? Do you reckon that would work? Tell me why it would work. Wow, OK. Let's try. And so long as you're willing to try things and if it doesn't work, stop doing them, you just learn and everything keeps growing. And then, like, you, you learn really, really a lot from yeah. other people. Yep. And I valued that learning really, really a lot. Mm. It, it's super important mm. for both personal and professional growth. Definitely helps. And we have volunteer leave at work, which I think is quite common in many countries, but we encourage our staff to go and work in other organisations for a period of time. And yes, it's good for the community, but it's good for them because they see how other organisations do things and they come back with new ideas. So it's like I'm sending them off on a mission to find something new that we can do. And I think that's really good. And people find it exciting to work in another organisation for a while. And I just want to bring you back to the hiring process a little bit. Yeah. What do you think about job posting? You have very different approaches to hiring people, but what about when you have an open position? How do you advertise it? Because that seems still very templated, if I can mm. put it this way. Yeah, well, first of all, we ask the staff if, they all, if anybody knows anybody who would like to come and work with us, you know, referral basis, and we do that. We mostly use LinkedIn. Occasionally we'll use a recruiter. But it's often through social media that we find people or people find us. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I think for us at Viz Britain, it's still a bit of a standard process, but also because we are part of the whole government, so there is a mm. standard fixed system that you need to follow. Mm. But when looking at the latest recruits, yes, first of all, we look internally if there are people that really wants to come or want to be of a change of a job or wants to just explore a different position or, mm. or growth, depending on where they are at the moment. And then when we look externally, yes, social media, LinkedIn a lot, or our website, that's where people tend to go. Yeah, recruitment agencies rarely, only if you really need to, or maybe very high top level position. But doesn't happen very often. People generally figure it out or find out or you know or when I'm recruiting for someone in my team I share it to my whole network on LinkedIn or to the people I know or I messaged people in my class of PCMA 2020s and say you know is there anyone that you really know that might be interested in this so referrals as Sina said it's very important power of the network yeah <laughs> yes. and I think power and for me because I've been around for a while I can ring my peers and say look I've got this job going do you know of anybody and often what has happened, they say, oh, I've got someone on my team who's due for promotion. I don't want you to take them, but I have to tell them about this job. It'll be good <laughs> for them. <laughs> so it's, as you say, the power of the network. But that's where a valuable employer comes into play, right? Because as you said, it's a marriage, it's a partnership. Mm. You have to support people in their growth. Yep. And also if they want to change a position, which most of the time eventually happens, mm. just to let Absolutely. them go. And I think... Sometimes people leave because they're not happy and sometimes they leave because it's not a good fit. But often people leave because there's not, well, in my organisation, there's only so many different jobs you can have, you know. And that, that's the way life is and no one should stay too long in a job, particularly you thrive through learning and learning is through having different experiences, visiting another country, visiting another organisation, doing a course, all of those things. We do support people to do lots of study because... That's another way you can help people develop. 
I was just about to ask you that. <laughs> what are the ways and what kind of discussions also do you have to okay. support growth opportunities? Well, we have internal management development programs for lower, middle and senior level. We also have staff who are doing master's degrees and the DLI strike is they pay for one subject and the organisation will pay for the next subject so long as they pass and get a certain grade and they have to tell me what grade they're going to get. <laughs> And um, that works really well because they're also proud of how they're going and, and that's, you know, something to celebrate. We also pay for them to do short courses as well in relevant areas to their job because while the organisation's trying to do new things, you can't assume everyone's got the skills, but people can learn the skills. Exactly. Mm. Yep. We do also have a, a very, our very small mentorship program within this Britain. So we generally we ask people if they would like to be mentors and we have really lots of new people, especially within our marketing division, and, and they just want to really like learn and hear from people who have been in the company for much longer uh, how things work or if they can help from you know, a professional growth, sometimes even personal, depends on what the objective of that mentorship is. We do also have a mandatory of five learning days during the year. Mm -hmm. That's something that... I really like the fact that it's sort of compulsory rather than optional. Mm. Of course, you don't necessarily need to if you don't want to, but the fact that you know that the company is really focusing mm. on, on you and giving you the possibility of learning, that's key to me. Mm. And then during that, those days, they suggest some topics which they, they believe we, mm. you should explore or you should look at more. But then it's up to you in case you want to specifically develop some skills or learn about something else that you're interested in, then you're totally flexible to do it. And then if there are some mm. courses or other external mm. training that you want to do, again, our team is very supportive and we generally evaluate it case by case, uh, depending on what they want to do. But absolutely, learning is something really key. That's for the really good. The other part of when you report to me, and I think most senior managers do this, is part of reporting against your outcomes for your work is to talk about, well, what's the next skill or area you want to develop for yourself? Let's work out a plan for how you can do that over the next 12 months. So the person is deliberately learning, like having the five days learning is fantastic. I like people to nominate what it is, when we're going, how they're going to do it. So we, we can tick it off that they've got that next skill and then we go on to the next one after that. Yeah. I just want to turn that back to you personally. What's next for you in terms of personal development? No. What are you working on? Yeah. Well, I, I have a business coach. I've had a coach... For most of my career, I've had psychology coaches or business coaches, so I have sessions with my coach. I read endlessly about all kinds of things. I have the opportunity to meet some pretty high-powered people and I'm part of a network of CEOs in Australia. There's 400 CEOs that are invited to be part of this particular network. So I learn a lot from people who are in completely different industries to myself. And in Australia, it might be different to Europe, but there's not that many women CEOs still. So there's myself and my little group, my syndicate group, and there's me and the boys, <laughs> and they've got used to me and they know that I will challenge what they say. But I learn a lot about other industries. And what, and what you learn is that the issues of, of every industry are around people, technology and growth. It's always the same. That's what we're all trying to do, just different ways of doing it. That's very interesting. Yes. I am actually working a lot on my self-confidence. <laughs> It's always been kind of low, so what I'm trying to do every year is just sort of put myself in those positions that I would call uncomfortable in a way. And yet at the end of the day, once I do it, it's, okay. it's actually okay. <laughs> you know, there is nothing bad in that, but yeah. it helps you grow a lot. And even in, in, you know, in those cases where it doesn't go well, but you still, you still learn massively from these experiences. But yes, I try to put myself in an yeah, uncomfortable situation or... You know, here recording a podcast is something probably a couple of years ago I wouldn't have done. Mm. Or speaking in front of people. I've always been a bit afraid and then the more I do it, the more comfortable I become. And now, for instance, I, I don't really have any problems in doing it that anymore. Yeah, and just believing in myself a bit more is what I'm trying to do. But surrounding myself with people who, you know, are really great in doing these things, it's super useful because I can learn from them. I can see, you know... Mm how that works, how they react, how they behave. And most of the time I actually found out that they are afraid to and they get scared when they need to do these things. It just doesn't seem when they actually do it. 
So there is nothing really to worry about. <laughs> it's funny how many women, in fact all women, all women at all levels, have the imposter syndrome. And uh, what we all feel like we're not quite sure what we're doing, but we do it anyway. <laughs> um, and it's the classic thing about when women apply for jobs. There's yeah. 10 criteria for the job. They look at the three they don't have and worry about that. Yes. I wish sometimes I was a bit different to that, but male colleagues, they meet seven of the criteria. They figure they've got it in the bag. But we <laughs> yeah. worry about being perfect, and I think that's a really unfortunate thing that it we is. do to ourselves. And I think yeah. it's fantastic that you're doing it anyway, and I'm delighted you're oh, on this podcast you. with me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, no, thank you very much. But I do totally agree. Like, <laughs> personally, me, if I look at the job and I'm like, oh, you know, maybe I can do five of those things and not the other half, I think, oh, it's not the job for me. Well, now I'm trying to look at more at the other way and like, oh, you know, actually, maybe that could be great or there are many more things that I can learn. Like, mm. You don't necessarily need to go and apply for a job where you're already mm. capable and able to do everything that is written in that mm. job description. Absolutely. Otherwise, you can always learn, of course, mm. different organisation, different people, different things you do. But still, if you think you're already able to do that, mm. you know, you're, you're taking away that bit of you and know, growth and excitement. That and goes just full circle back to the job interviews, the, the way you do them. You don't even look at those cues because you know people can learn, but you look at the human side of the, of the person opposite. I Cultural that... fit, you know. What, what, you know exactly. what, can they share the dream of the, the journey we're on? Is it going to be right for them? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I hope more women hear that message that we all have imposter syndrome, but we all do it anyway. So That's the important bit. You can have it, but you do it anyway. Yes. yes. And as we're just uh, wrapping the conversation, I wanted to ask you, was there anything we didn't address but we should address? I think uh, the only thing I'd say is we all work, but the work is only one part of our lives. And it really is important to live and work, not just work to live. Or if we're saying it whichever way it goes, but it is just one component of your life and you are a whole person and all of the parts are equally important. Love that. Yeah, that's really great. It's very difficult to follow up after <laughs> this, really. But because work also takes many, many years of your life, mm. I really want people to go and look for jobs and do something they're really proud of or that makes you really feel good. Mm. You shouldn't do a job that you don't like or you shouldn't do a job where you don't agree with the value of the organisation mm. or you don't agree with the missions or the outcomes or anything that the organisation wants to do or that your team wants to do. If you are aligned into that, you're going to really enjoy your work much, much more. And that if you work for that, in you know, this purpose-driven culture, I mean, that's really great. That's, I think, where most of the best performances come from, mm. from people. That's yeah. really good. I think we're in good hands with the next generation that's coming up, right? <laughs> Indeed. Well, thank you both so much for, for this and being on the podcast. Thank oh. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for having us. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed our conversation. And if you would like to hear more, please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you want to explore additional perspectives on the industry, check out pcma.org convene. Until next time.